Welcome to the latest episode of Aspian's Reroute and Logistics podcast. I'm your host, John Wilson, the Head of Logistics and Transport Division at Aspian Search and Selection. We are a search and selection business that are based within the transport and logistics industry. And joining me is my co-host, Beverly Bell, the former Senior Traffic Commissioner and CEO of Beverly Bell Training Consultancy. Together, we've created this, created this series of podcasts with the goal to shed the light on important topics that are greatly impacting the world of logistics. Throughout the episodes, we'll be delving into important subjects such as diversity and ethnicity, women's role in logistics, and the involvement of young people within the industry. Each episode will feature a prominent figure from the logistics sector engaging in thoughtful discussion with Beverly Bell. So in our latest episode, we are privileged to have the Fabius Leon Daniels, the former Managing Director of the Transport for London, as our esteemed guest. With over 45 years' experience in the public sector, Leon brings a wealth of knowledge, having successfully managed his own businesses and held senior positions in major companies. Among some of his most impressive accomplishments, Leon has led the, the delivery of the transport service for the London Olympic Games in 2012, as well as overseeing the implementation of a £3.5 billion worth of road, rail and transport infrastructure for London. So without any further delay, I will now hand the microphone over to Beverly as she guides our conversation with Leon. Good afternoon, Leon, and thank you very much for taking the time and trouble to come up to Liverpool, a wonderful city. When was the last time you were here, Leon, and what for? I was just thinking that. Um, I think the last time I was in Liverpool was for Labour Party conference, which from memory is probably 2018. And that, I'm afraid, was the last time I've come. We've had a pandemic in the meantime, so not travel to some places as much as I would like to have done but really nice to be here in Liverpool. Well that's really good that you're pleased to be here so I would like to just ask a few questions. Um, so why would you come and attend a Labour Party conference or indeed any party conference? Oh well since I've been retired from Transport for London I act as a director or an advisor to a range of companies so one of the companies I've been working with with autonomous vehicles uh, they were exhibiting at all of the party conferences um, back end of the last decade, showing to the politicians and to the party members and everybody what autonomous vehicles really could be like for the future. So we had a full-size car, it drives itself, and of course we had all of the politicians from all of the parties taking a look at uh, what autonomous vehicles means and how soon they'll be here. Do we need to be scared or not? Well, I'm not sure about being scared. I think autonomous vehicles have got a great future. Firstly, it's not going to be like when we went decimal. It's not just going to happen overnight. We'll suddenly switch from one thing to another. Uh, Leon, I don't remember us going decimal. Oh, yes, you do. and Because um, yeah, I certainly do. Uh, but we did have... Uh, what's happening now? I'm just going to start that all over again. Sorry. Yes. What's happening in modern cars, modern vehicles now, is that the automation is getting there gradually. So you buy a modern car, it's going to have dynamic cruise control, it's going to have lane keeping assist, it's going to have automatic parking. So already all these autonomous features are starting to be built into the car. You still need a driver, somebody's still in charge and the legislation has to improve a bit. But the best thing of all about autonomous vehicles is that they'll be very much safer. I mean, let's face it, four or five people a day are killed on Britain's roads by human-powered, human-driven motor vehicles. Now, autonomous vehicles aren't going to be perfect. They're going to be loads better than we currently have with human drivers. And you'll have seen very occasionally an autonomous vehicle, perhaps on test in another part of the world, occasionally has an accident and very sadly, occasionally people are killed. But actually, we are killing four or five people a day anyway. So big step forward for autonomous vehicles will be on safety. And we condone those 1,500 deaths a year in this country, and it's a good job we're doing something about it. So that's a really good reason to engage with government and, and future governments. Uh, we've got an, uh, some elections coming up in the not-too-distant future. Um, how do transport professionals like yourself influence government policy effectively, and in fact, should they influence government policy? Oh, absolutely, they should. Um, actually, politicians know nothing. You have to tell them. You have to teach them. Uh, And they want to hear. They want to hear what the burning issues of the day are from everybody in the country, from the electorate. They want to 
understand that. So influencing government policy, we're in a very special time. Many of the combined authorities have their mayoral elections in May 24. We're going to have a general election probably October, November 24. So this particular point in the electoral cycle is very important. This is the time to start to influence the manifesto writers for all of the major political parties. Because if something's in the manifesto, it stands a better chance of becoming policy. So get it in the manifesto and whatever we're interested in across transport, whether it's rail, whether it's road, whether it's about freight and logistics, whether it's about safety, autonomous vehicles, decarbonisation, whatever it is, there's no better time than to start to influence government policy now by making sure that all of the people who are writing the manifestos and devising these policies we get all that stuff in so that it becomes an election issue and having become an election issue somebody wins and hopefully that government will take some of this stuff forward. That's really interesting to hear that so thanks for that. Um, just looking back rather than looking forward um, you worked at Transport for London for a few years? I did. Best part of the job and worst part of, part of the job? Oh well look, firstly the best part of the job was working with the wonderful people phenomenally talented people, lots of young people, very, very clever people, uh, able to put their brains to many different sorts of problems. Uh, the downside, of course, it's a public job. Your name is out there and frankly, you are uh, investigated, checked. People find out things in your private life or they find out things. You can't even just travel on the underground and have a, and scowl at somebody without somebody being photographing it and putting it on social media. So the good side, as I say, the people, the bad side, of course, is that you don't have any private life at all. It's all in the public domain, everything from your expenses to your telephone bill and everything. And so, frankly, being a public servant in many ways is a hugely exciting job. It comes with some downsides. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more on that. Um, just going more to the more positive side, young people, you're talking about in TfL. Um, the transport sector, and you're obviously much more on the sort of passenger side rather than freight, but I think both parts of the sector suffer from getting young people coming into the industry or the sector, not just coming in, but, but staying in. W what's your view on that? Do you think we're inclusive enough? Do you think we're diverse enough? Could we be doing more? We're miles off, frankly. Um, the passenger transport industry is seriously white male dominated and that's really strange because actually the majority of our passengers are women and a very high proportion of our workforce are from ethnic minorities so we're nothing like diverse enough uh, I think the passenger transport industry has made quite a good start uh, and things are improving and in fact it's happening around the world and I'm shortly off to Kuala Lumpur to speak to the Women in Rail conference. Last time I did that, which was pre-pandemic, we have Muslim women, teenage Muslim women, wearing the full Muslim dress, sat there row after row asking how to get into highway engineering, traffic signal engineering, railway signaling. Amazing. For the first time we're seeing what's typically a male dominated industry where young people are really interested and the reason why they're interested we don't make enough of this the reason why they're interested is of course these jobs are really interesting they're really good jobs they're involving computers they're involving thinking thinking things through using using artificial intelligence working globally with other people around the world learning things and so on so we're finding now other than white men, we're finding increasingly people are interested in joining the passenger transport sector and for that matter the freight and logistics sector because as is always the case with technology, really dull old manual type jobs are being replaced with very exciting high tech, really good intelligent jobs. Um, so we started to go there. However, we have a long way to go because around the world it has been normal for white male people to dominate transport industries, even in other countries. You know, and uh, the British dominated the transport scene in Hong Kong. Of course, we've been dominating the scene in Australia and in Dubai and in the Middle East elsewhere. So things are really changing. A lot more to go. So why are we dominating it? Is it because we're the best and we're, we're taking our best practice across the world? Oh, look, Britain is doing a lot of things. In fact, many of the things that Britain is doing, uh, we don't make enough of. 
uh, the whole idea of railway signalling without actually having signals by the side of the tracks or all the information being in the cab and the train understanding this and so on. Britain is an absolute pioneer for uh, the latest sort of railway signalling. So the days, you might remember, we just used to have lights, red lights and green lights and so on. That's all being replaced. We're doing in this country amazing things on railway technology, especially on signalling, and we're definitely leading the world on that. So if we translate that then to your, your cues of, of Muslim ladies who are wanting to get into the sector, what's their secret in terms of getting them interested in the first place and increasing their awareness and knowledge that it's not just working in transport, it's working in tech and all those other things? Yeah. What can we learn from that? Well, it is, it is about dispelling the image. And the image of the transport sector, I'm afraid, uh, involves very strong men doing, doing hard labour. Uh, and that's what we really are having to overcome because there's still quite an element of the fact that these are dirty jobs done by strong men which is far from the truth so throughout all of our international associations uh, our chartered institutes the uh, international passenger transport and railway organizations that exist around the world this is all about waving the flag for good quality high-tech jobs as i say we're doing loads of it and the world is doing quite well across this but tons more to do Okay, so you've talked about uh, professional organisations. I think you're currently president of the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport. How long is that tenure for, Leon? Well, it's just a year, so we're halfway through. Uh, my goodness me, doesn't time fly when you're having a great time? So I'm very honoured to be president at the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport, one of the chartered institutes that exists, a membership organisation that brings together everybody involved in logistics and in transport generally. So it covers freight, covers passenger. Um, and it's been tremendous this year. We were just at um, the UITP World Congress in Barcelona. What's UITP? Um, it's, it's... What's it about? What does it do? Right. So ask me the question again. So you're saying that CILT has been representing itself at the recent UITP conference. So In a couple of sentences, just so, tell our listeners what, what it does. So UITP is the Global Passenger Transport Organisation. It's been going for uh, over 100 years. Uh, and every couple of years, the world comes together for a World Congress where we learn, see and look at what everybody's doing. So we just had it in Barcelona, which was tremendous. So... Barcelona is all very exciting, but let's take us back to CILT, whose head office is in, I think, Northamptonshire. How do we make sure that people who are joining CILT are young at the start of their careers? They're not male, pale and stale at the end of their careers. How do, how do we get them in? I think times have changed. So when I was a young person, joining one of the Chartered Institutes was an obvious thing to do, to learn to get the right qualifications, to meet other people in the industry and generally be seen as one of the potential future leaders. All that's changed. Uh, young people now are much less interested. They're certainly not interested in a sort of old person's drinking club, which can sometimes be the reputation that some organisations have. So CILT does a number of amazing things. Firstly, it's involved in accreditation. It's certainly involved in education and in training. Uh, but what we don't have these days, employers rarely require membership of a chartered mm. institute to be a prerequisite for a senior job. And young people can't always see the point. Uh, and as I said, uh, if they think it is some sort of social vehicle, well, frankly, young people are so busy nowadays, they have plenty of social vehicles of their own. They certainly don't need, don't need another one. But what we're trying to do as far as CILT is concerned is to make, make it really clear. Clearly, having that on your CV, being a member of the Chartered Institute itself, ought to be, you ought to be proud of it. Secondly, there are just so many opportunities, in particular the education and the training. Uh, not forgetting then the opportunities to meet other people in the industry. Perhaps if you're a young person, people who have even, only even read about uh, and actually be able to talk to these people and hopefully drive your career forward. It's especially useful for young people, but uh, as I say, the days of it just being an automatic rite of passage is gone. 
and membership organizations generally, and membership organizations are often in decline, uh, they have to work increasingly hard, to, firstly, to overcome the age bias, mm-hmm. overcome the diversity and inclusion bias, over and, and get over the sort of London-centric nature of some of these things. So all that's got to be done. Uh, Rome, of course, wasn't built in a day, although, of course, if you and I had been doing it, it would have been done in the morning. But we would have, we have to make sure these organizations modernize and uh I think we have to carry the people with us. This involves some quite, I think, radical Mm. changes. Certainly the days of a membership organisation where you pay several hundred pounds a year and you get a a magazine every few weeks and an occasional invitation to go to a dinner, I think those days are gone. And we've got to get even more clever about how people access the information, where they get their information from. And frankly, if if I had a real thing for CILT, uh, I don't know what you do on the internet, uh, but I have the BBC News as my anchor homepage. That's where I naturally go back to. That's 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 the first page that comes up when I switch it on. I think we'll have got somewhere if when people get to the office and they switch their computers on the CILT website with the latest news in transport, the latest opportunities and developments. So if the CILT website is your homepage in your office, then I think we might have made some progress. That'll be a legacy. Um, so on the networking side, obviously, any sort of organisation is very good for networking. Um, when I was applying for jobs, if I didn't do very well, my mother used to say, don't worry, Beverly, it's not what you know, it's who you, who you know. So, so, Leon, if you were going for an interview for, for, for a post now, uh, what would, advice would your mother have given you? Well, it's interesting. My, my mother would have given two pieces of advice, um, one, one official, if you like, and one practical. So the official one would be that when you're in an interview, there is a terrible tendency to keep talking. And those of us that conduct interviews sometimes remain silent because eventually you feel so embarrassed, you feel you better say something else and something else and something else. Filling the silence. Uh, Filling the silence. So the first thing my mother would have said is, when you've said what you had to say, shut up. Stop talking and just smile back. Did you listen? Yeah, yes, I did. I'm I'm doing it now, can't you tell? I'm teasing you. (laughs) Uh, And the second thing she would have told me, in fact, she did tell me, was about my inherent clumsiness, which my clumsiness, by the way, we all get this, in a particular formal situation, our ability to coordinate things gets worse. So guess what? You're about to be called into the interview room. You've got your coat, you've got your bag. And the girl says, would you like a cup of tea? And you say, oh, yes, please. Thank you very much. And as soon as you've got tea in your hand, they open the door. So now you're trying to get in through a door with a coat, a bag and a cup of tea, which you're now starting to spill. Now you've got boiling hot water on your fingers. And the interview panel has just had their first glimpse of you, this complete, completely awkward, embarrassing, difficult person who is trying to juggle some things. So she would have said, accept no hospitality whatsoever. Just you can do without a cup of tea for another half an hour. Good advice, I'm sure. So if listeners had to remember just one thing about you or about your message from this interview today, what would it be? There is a famous phrase, which is the one that broadly says, if you find a job that you love, you'll never work a day in your life. So I was very lucky to find an industry that I loved. And although I had lots of jobs in it and did many things in different parts of the world, different parts of the country and different sectors, I loved the industry. So therefore, I would say... um, I have never really felt like I've worked a day in my life. I've certainly had some difficult times and some stresses, but uh, I really have enjoyed my whole time in the sector. And therefore, as some, for something to take away, hopefully people will take away a message that says, golly, I'm going to find something like that and I'm going to feel like that at the end of my career as well. That's really good advice. So is it buses and all sorts of vehicles including trams and trains and the underground which you've told me I'm to call it rather than the tube that move the people that interest you or is it the people that interest you it's interesting Um, I'm afraid it is both I am fascinated by the movement of large numbers of people and you'll remember, and we've talked about this in, in our other occasions, you know, I, I was fascinated by the Olympics, mm-hmm. fascinated by major sporting events, fascinated by uh, other big events, like in London, the Notting Hill Carnival, which broadly is moving a million people in and out each day. So I am fascinated by the movement of people. Uh, of course, vehicles in all sorts, railway, uh, tram, bus and so on, vehicles can be a large part of that. But I am fascinated by the movement of people as a whole. Uh, 
as well as actually the mechanism by which we get there, for which the vehicles themselves are of interest. Um, this now goes into two different directions. Let's just one more thing about the people. So uh, just to take an example, uh, Notting Hill Carnival, which I mentioned, uh, not quite a million people these days. But one of the things interesting with Carnival is that as the last people are arriving, the first people are leaving. Mm. And it just peaks briefly at about two o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, you go equivalent to Love Parade or Christopher Street Parade in Berlin. They're all in by 12 and they're all there till six. So it's, again, a very large number of people. But actually the profile for the movement of the people, in particular the public transport operation, is entirely different. Uh, so I'm fascinated by those things. Then on the vehicles, of course, uh, I'm interested in the way in which people get transported. I'm fascinated by the technology. Uh, and as you know, I'm part owner with Lord Peter Hendy of a 1949 double-decker bus, which we know. take out, uh, especially for charity. Amazing that in the period immediately after World War II, uh, human beings were making, without any form of computers, whole technically really brilliant vehicles with the latest technology for post-war um, and that that technology is so good and the structure is so good that bus is still running you know now very many decades later fast forward that to today uh, we already talked about autonomous vehicles but just looking at the technology now let's take a bus as an example wi-fi charging air conditioning uh, use of different sorts of materials in order to reduce weight and, of course, the whole movement to zero emission, which is just extraordinary. And not just that, but making people who have um, problems or challenges around using public transport feel more comfortable and safer, whether it's a visible disability or, or a hidden disability. Um, so I could maybe say you might be a bit of a bus nut. You could say it. I could say it. I, don't you have... I'm, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't. I think you have. But uh, No, not at all. But I do know that you're doing some work... I can put it in those terms, just because I like to wind you up, as you know, Leon, about the Bus Centre of Excellence. So do you want to tell us a little of bit course. about that? So the Bus Centre of Excellence was in the 21... So the Bus Centre of Excellence was in the 2021 bus policy paper under the Boris Johnson government. And it promised uh, a new organisation that wasn't going to replace or duplicate anything that anybody else did, but just wanted to find a way in this very fast-moving technolo technological era that we're in, where cross-fertilisation of good practice, good ideas, training, skills, and making sure that people have access to the latest information uh, was essential. So very kindly, I've been asked to chair the advisory board for the Bus Centre of Excellence. It is housed and operated on behalf of the Department for Transport by the Chartered Institute of Highways and Transportation, uh, and it has just recently been launched in the last two or three months. The first visible sign is the website, which you can find easily, the Bus Centre of Excellence. Uh, the website is already live. We're already starting to gather together people's stories and information. In due course, there will be free or cheap training, and there'll be a number of other features across the Bus Centre of Excellence as it develops. Uh, it's funded by the DFT. That funding runs on for about 18 months or so, which will get the whole thing started. The advisory board which I chair has every possible stakeholder around the table, operators, local authorities, uh, other people with serious interests including those as you mentioned about accessibility, uh, those people from central and local government uh, and people representing the users as well as the operators and so on. So it's a very broad church, I'm really excited, I'm thrilled and honoured to be the chair of it. Um, and uh, we've met now just a couple of times. Work is really starting and un getting underway, and there'll be loads more from the Bus Centre of Excellence coming this year. What I love about you is your enthusiasm. Do you actually ever get time to relax? And if so, football, rugby, remembering we're in Liverpool, where you know we take our football extremely seriously, football, rugby, something else, or none of the above? I've never been to a football match in my <gasps> life. Leon. Okay. So that probably answers that. In fact, I've never been to a rugby match in my life either. So that's both of those. So you're not going to catch me on any of the football teams in Liverpool. Um, although I do have a dear friend of mine, used to be my finance director. He, great fan of a team. I'm sure he kept on calling it West Ham nil. <laughs> no, that's Lincoln City nil. <laughs> OK, so if it's not sport, theatre, cinema, 
ballet or opera? Mm, all, all of those. Um, and, favorite, and favorite. indeed, I'm at the I'm at the theatre uh, this week, uh, so uh, all that I enjoy for, for quite different reasons. Uh, theatre, of course, because of the the magic of the experience, uh, the fact that people are there working and delivering such beautiful interpretations. Cinema, because of course the way in which technology has developed, um, and the, in the whole development of um, cinematography is extraordinary i can remember a time so will you when we first got our video recorders at home people said that'll be the death of the cinema in fact there are now more people going to the cinema than ever because as we've got our home recorders now our dvd players and um, and and the streaming services cinemas have gone in for bigger screens better sound systems have gone in for better seating the chance to eat and drink at your seat as well as the fact that the technology now allows the filmmakers to make quite different sorts of film, which I think is extraordinary. Uh, and I recently, there's a very good um, film about the life of Steve Jobs um, that picks up three periods in his life. And so they filmed it, the three periods in his life, the first third in 16 millimeter, the second in 35 millimeter, and the last bit in 70 millimeter, re referencing the technology of the time of what they were actually representing, which is tremendous. So um, I'm afraid I'm one of those slightly geeky people in the theatre and cinema who's looking around as well as at the story, because I'm fascinated by how it works. Um, but of course, that's sort of relaxation. Uh, um, well, to a degree, but that's all about how technology can support what we do rather than act as, act as a barrier. Um, so you talked about food and drink. I'm not suggesting we could eat our, our meal at our cinema seats, but which do you go for, Leon? Uh, Sunday roast with all the trimmings at home or smashed avocado with poached eggs on toast for brunch? That is a loaded question because that's, trying to, that's trying to separate my, my, my North Country roots um, and, and the traditional English Sunday roast lunch and the Kings Road, Chelsea sort of brunchy sort of modern way so i'm going to go for the smashed avocado brunch but that's partially because um the older you get the more interested in the future i get so i although i'm deeply interested in the past and in history i prefer to keep current so tell us about your work with the london transport museum quickly uh, so i was a trustee of the london transport museum in my time in tfl and I'm now uh, instead now chairing the trustees at the London Bus Museum at Brooklyn's Museum, Weybridge, Surrey. That's Brooklyn's Museum, Weybridge, Surrey, uh, which is, uh, so the London Bus Museum is an independent charity uh, resident at Brooklyn's Museum. Uh, and there we have a private collection of over 40 vehicles going back to the earliest horse bus. Uh, I'm spending quite a bit of my time uh, with them. Everybody there volunteers, so there's no paid staff. The volunteers um, are uh, there every day. It's open 363 days a year. Do you get young people volunteering? Well, actually, we get some. It's a tricky place, Weybridge, because it's the sort of place, I'm afraid, where you do need a car to get to it because it's not well situated for public transport. And I'm afraid, because of the bit of Surrey that we are in, there are lots of other alternative things for young people to do. But we have a few, and we're working really very hard. Now, we are, we are diverse, I have to say, certainly across um, the, the other issues of diversity and inclusion. Young people, some, as I say, quite a lot of competition in Surrey for young people. Okay. So, um, Leon, tell us one thing um, today that nobody else knows about you just now. Well, it's a tall order to say nobody else knows because okay. a, few people, a few people who are still alive might remember, but who knows. So I had a very happy time in an earlier part of my life uh, driving for film and TV. Oh. And so you will have seen me as a blur in the background of a number of feature films really? and TV episodes, including The Professionals and <gasps> Chinese Detective. Oh, you met Bodie and, and Doyle. Actually, I did. Not only did I meet uh, Lewis Collins and Martin Shaw, um, I would drive for Martin Shaw from time to time. Oh. Um, Lewis Collins, of course, sadly died um, and um, never quite did anything. I also worked on a film with Lewis Collins called Who Dares Wins, which I'm also in. Um, Martin Shaw, quite separately, um, has gone on to do very many really wonderful things. He doesn't much like talking about The Professionals, which was right at the start of his career. Why? Uh, I don't know, but um, okay. he, just, he just chooses not to. Um, and uh, so you will see me in a few interesting places, Actually, including, including if you really want to find something, Beverly, 
just go to that final crash scene at the end of American Werewolf in London. It's one of my favourite films. Two buses and 24 cars, which was filmed live in Piccadilly Circus in the early hours of a June night. In fact, actually, it went on so long, the sky was getting light by the time it happened. And um, the chief stunt coordinator on that, Vin Armstrong, um, who, of course, was Harrison Ford's double in Indiana Jones and others. So Vin, who I still talk to, um, and in fact, we were just talking um, back end of last year. He and his wife are both um, had a whole career of being stunt people. Um, and the Sean Connery, James Bond remake, uh, Never Say Never Again, when Sean Connery is stabbed by the hostage in the pre-title sequence, that's Vin Armstrong's wife. So uh, that was all very exciting. It's a young person's job. I broke my thumb uh, in the Chinese Detective. Well, thank God it was only a thumb. Yeah, it could have been worse. But in a crash in Chinese Detective, when we, the timing wasn't all perfect, um, uh, I managed to break my thumb in that. Um, well, I didn't, yes. I didn't know that. So there, there's idea. something that you didn't know. I didn't. And most people won't know because, of course, that's really a very long time ago. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's available still on DVD. And well, I shall watch again with, with renewed interest. I'm afraid really. in none of this stuff I am any, I am nothing other than a blur. Oh, that'll be know, fine. In a couple of seconds in the background. That'll, that'll, that'll be fine. That's interesting, really interesting. OK, so, Leon, thank you very much for your time and for answering those, those questions. It's now your turn to ask me no more than two questions about anything you might have wanted to ask me. So, firstly... What's been the high spot of your career? The high spot of my career? Um, can I have two? Or as my mother would say, may I have two? I suppose breaking the glass ceiling. Um, you know, being the first female traffic commissioner and being the youngest. And you are talking about the industry being male, pale and stale. Um, being able to engage with men of a certain age who wondered, I wondered how they ever managed to make the tea until I came along because, you know, they asked me to make the tea when I became the traffic commissioner. And, and uh, you know, I have to say, um, you know, getting the, getting the CBE was, was a good day. It was a really good day. Um, but the, if I'm really honest, the highlight of my career was when my daughter got married and, and she gave a little speech and she said that I was a bit of a role model for breaking a glass ceiling and that made me... Have a little moment. That's lovely. That's a really nice story, isn't it? That was really nice. That was that's that's definitely something to be treasured, isn't it? Yes. Sometimes at interview, I throw a couple of questions in. So this is not your question. This is just so. So normally at interview, I ask a candidate that I tell I tell a candidate that I'd met their best friend. What did how did their best friend describe them? And then then they tell me some things. This is not your question. Don't worry. I'm okay. just letting you recover. And then. When they've answered that, they say, oh, you know, I'm funny and I'm lively and I'm good to be with and I'm kind to my parents and so on. I say, okay. So the second person we interviewed was the person that really hates you the most, the person that respects you the least. How does your chief critic describe you? You'd be surprised to know how many people can't answer the question about their, about their chief critic. So I'm not going to ask you about your best friend or your chief critic, actually. I'm not going to ask you about either. But instead I was going to ask you, at some time in the future, when you're no longer with us, how would you most like to be remembered? I sometimes make a joke about being kind to children and small animals because I am told that I have a bit of a fearsome reputation and I would want people to describe me as one of those chocolates, tough on the outside and soft on the inside, I think is how I'd like to be remembered. But when you talked about critics and friends, I think often they stay, say, the stay, <laughs> say the same. And, and I can tell you something now that I've not shared in a, in a sort of public forum. When I applied to be a traffic commissioner and they take up references, and about three days before I was due to start the job, they rang my business partner for a reference because they realised they had to quickly send it off to Secretary of State. And my business partner, who was a solicitor, had no idea how to give a reference, so he just told them about me. And I could hear him on the phone, and he described me as being slightly bossy and spending too much money. And I thought that rather summed me up beautifully. So if when I'm not here, that's how I'm remembered, then so be it. Well, it's a long time in the future. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm certain it's a long time in the future, but that's a lovely way to want to be remembered. 
Thank you. Well, Leon, thank you very much indeed. It's been lovely to talk to you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much to Beverly and Leon for being here today. I really enjoyed today's discussion. I think one thing we can really take on board from today's discussion is that all cultures and countries face similar problems when trying to break the glass ceiling. So if you want to hear more from Aspium, Beverly or Leon, or interested in the work we do here, follow us on our socials, which is links, LinkedIn, Instagram, or our website, or give the team a call now on 0151 209 2050. Thanks for listening to Reroute and Logistics. Just before you go, on Spotify, if you enjoyed the episode, don't forget to follow, save, and click the notification bell. Or if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe below and leave a comment.